her husband's twisted leg, the wife collapsed. <laughs> Meanwhile, the snake slithered quietly away. Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy 4, verse 5, keep your head in all situations. Like us, the Apostle Peter had problems keeping his head in all situations. In Matthew chapter 16, he confesses Jesus as the Messiah. And then a few verses later, he is called a stumbling block by Jesus. He cuts off Melchus's ear, which Jesus heals immediately. Peter denies Jesus three times and then runs away weeping. But in John chapter 20, when they're done fishing and near the shore, John looks up and says, it's the Lord. And Peter jumps out of the boat and starts running towards shore. It's Peter then who's told by Jesus, if you love me, you'll feed my sheep. And then in Acts chapter 2, it's Peter who delivers the, gospel, the first gospel sermon telling the people that Jesus died for them. And they want to know, what do we need to do about this? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. And for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Many of you tonight have taken the steps to become a Christian. But maybe you're here and you haven't. Tonight, you want to be close to Jesus. You want to obey him. You want to be his child. Maybe you're in need of prayers of this church family for strength, for guidance, and following Jesus while keeping your head in the game at all times. If we can help you tonight, encourage you, won't you come as together we stand and sing 514. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through his infinite mercy. His shouting forever I am. Redeem. Graveside service was 
this afternoon. Our sympathy is also extended to Melanie Starcher and her family at the passing of her husband and our dear brother in Christ, Josh Starcher. The funeral will be here Friday at 6 p.m. Our sympathy is also extended to Stephanie Williams and her entire family at the passing of her grandmother and our dear sister in Christ, Charlotte Buckland. Calling hours are uh, from noon until 1 p.m. at the uh, Price Melroy Funeral Home in Kenton, Ohio. And the funeral will follow at 1 p.m. That is on Saturday. Tomorrow night, there'll be a teen Bible study at Tim Hortons from 7 to 8 p.m. Sunday is Bring a Sack Sunday. See the list in the bulletin of those items that are needed to uh, pack our pantry. Anything else tonight before? All right, I'll lead us in prayer, sir. Please, thank you.
dependent upon God. What else would you say? How would you define what prayer is? How would you define them? Yes? Also acknowledging God as the supreme God. Or okay. God. And he's the one who us. Acknowledging God as the supreme being and supreme God. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. For forgiveness of the past sins I have made. Okay. All right. Okay. I would, I would define it as your own personal counselor. My own personal counselor. I like that one. He is that for sure. He listens to you and everything. Knows everything about you already. So you don't have to tell him too much detail. But it's good. He wants you to tell. Tell it all. I heard about a guy who, who uh, encountered a bit of trouble while flying his little plane. He called the control tower, said pilot to tower. I'm 300 miles from the airport, 600 feet above the ground. I'm on the field. I'm descending rapidly. Please advise me. Over. Tower to pilot. The dispatcher began. Repeat after me. Our Father who art in heaven. <laughs> Prayer is, uh, for the most part, an untapped resource, an unexplored continent where untold treasures remain to be unearthed. It is talked about more than anything else, but is practiced less than anything else. And yet, for the believer, it remains the greatest gift that we have other than salvation. That I can go to my Father and I can talk to Him about anything and about everything. And He always He's always awake at night waiting to hear from you, right? Always. Never, never close down. You, you can't really be a good Christian and not pray. Just like you can't have a good marriage if you don't talk to your wife. You can't be you can be a Christian and not pray. Just like you can be married and not talk to your wife. But in both circumstances, you will be miserable. So the fact is. Prayer is really a pipeline of communication between us and God. God wants to hear from us. He loves to hear from us. He loves to hear your voice. He loves for you to bring your concerns. So tonight we're going to look at Jesus. We're going to look at Jesus prayed and the type of prayer life that Jesus had And uh, as we look at it. First of all, I want you to understand, prayer dominated the life of Jesus. It dominated. In fact, you will find that prayer formed a habit in Jesus' life. There are 20 different times you will see the word pray in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Over half of them are in the Gospel, Gospel of Luke, where Luke would show more the humanity of Jesus and shows that Jesus was always dependent upon his Father. What are some occasions when Jesus prayed? Tell me some occasions when Jesus prayed. All right, when? In the garden. In the garden. What else? On the cross. On the cross. What else? After he had a long, hard day of preaching and healing people. After he had a long, hard day of teaching and preaching and healing people, he prayed. What else? Before eating. Before eating. What else? Before he raised Lazarus. Before he raised Lazarus. He raised Lazarus. He prayed. What else? The other times he prayed? Oh, there's so many. He always prayed. There's only one place I can find the Bible that doesn't order him to pray to God for the food that they were going to take. He always prayed. Always prayed. Every time. Every example. Yes, Dorothy. Before he instituted the Lord's Supper. Before he instituted the Lord's Supper. Yes. We don't see it in the temptation, but for the 40 days, he had to be praying. Uh, he does pray then. Yes. He does pray. I'm sure he prayed in the, in, during the temptation too. But before that, his baptism he prays. All right? So many occasions when Jesus prayed, uh, Jesus prays regularly. He probably observed the custom, first of all, of praying three times a day. Now, as a Jew, most Jews tradition would pray three times a day. You'll see in Mark's account, chapter 1, verse 45, he got up early in the morning, 
early in the morning while it was still dark, and he went and he went to a solitary place. Now, why do you think he did that? Why did he get up early in the morning while it's still dark, and why did he go off to a solitary place? What's that? Peaceful. Just him and God. Why else? You think he was already used to this relationship? Yeah, the conversation between him and his father, they were together all the time. All right, okay. So he's already used to that. Anybody else? What's, what's about, I know that you have spent some time praying early in the morning. Maybe you've got a particular place you'd like to pray. What is there about that? What is there about that? Nobody's going to bother me. What is there about that? A solitary place. Starts my day. Huh? Starts my day. Starts your day off. It's, a, it's very peaceful, isn't it? When you began to pray like, like that. Now, when Jesus fed the 5,000 at the close of the day in Matthew 14, which you make reference to in verse 23, he dismissed disciples and again... Went on the mountainside while it was dark, and it went along along to pray. Why didn't he bring all his disciples with him? Why didn't he get away? He wanted to finish that time with God and his father. Intimate time. All right. Uh, what is about that intimate time when you're praying just between you and God? Makes it so special to you. You're not putting on a show. Well, you're not putting on a show. All right? It's not our dear God, Heavenly Father, how great thou art. You know, you're not putting on a show. Yes. Just you and him. You and him. Nobody interrupt you. Nobody interrupt me. I can be me. All right? I can reveal the very depths of my heart and my soul and all that I am. My father in heaven. So even he was surrounded by a crowd. One time in Luke 5, 16. Again, he withdrew to pray. Withdrew to a lonely place to pray. What were some of the favorite places for Jesus to pray? What were some of the favorite places? We've already mentioned one already. Upon a mountain. Upon a mountain. That's one of them. What's another place? Huh? In the garden. In the garden he prayed. Mount of Olives went out as usual. Luke 22, 39 says, went out as usual. What you, what, how would you find the word usual, John? Usual. Usual. Yeah. All the time. All the time. It's kind of a regular, regular pattern, right? Usual. He's habitual. Habitually goes out to the garden. On praise, all right? And in the third place was a solitary place that Jesus would go and pray. Now, Jesus would also pray in the presence of, of others. In Luke 9, we'll come back to this here in just a minute. In Luke 9, on Mount Transfiguration, this would also be in Matthew 17. Well, who did he take with him on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John, all right? Jesus was praying in a certain place and and then you got Luke 11, verse 1. says he was praying at a certain place. And the disciples said, hey, uh, we want you to teach us to pray. All right? John, John's disciples know how to pray. We want you to teach us how to pray. And then you got John chapter 11, which has already been mentioned. At Lazarus' tomb, when Lazarus was uh, resurrected, Jesus prayed there as well for the people. When he prayed, his prayers were prayed with passion. How do you define passion? How do you define the word passion? Heartfelt. Heartfelt. Matthew, Luke chapter 3, verse 1, was at his baptism. And when he prayed, what happened? What happened? Luke 3, verse 1. When he prayed, what happened? Yeah. 
heavens opened, the dove came down. So we got a reaction here, don't we? So when he prayed, and he prayed passionately, there was a reaction from God, wasn't there? All right? In Luke 6, uh, before he called his disciples, you know, he, what did he do there? How, in Luke 6, when he just called his disciples, what did he do? Anybody recall what he did? For how long? Huh? He prayed the whole entire night. All right? How many of you have ever been up all night? Let me see your hands. All right? Most of the time, we've probably been up all night with what? Working. 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 Yeah, you do that a lot, don't you? <laughs> huh? What's that? What's that? Lock in. Lock in, all right. What else? Most of the time, you ever spend up all night? Working. Working. All right. Worry. What else? It's been all night. Sick. Sick. Our right, child was sick. Being at the hospital when somebody's in there. To... All right. Being in the hospital when somebody you love is there. All right. I I remember a few times being up most of the night. I think the first time I ever recall being up at night, I had to study for an exam in, in uh, college. And if I didn't pass that exam, I failed everything. I mean, let me tell you what, I stayed up and I knew that the answers the next day, that test, just like that. So all night, but Jesus stays up all night in order to pray for him to select the right guys. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, verse 29. Luke 29, we're going to read verse 28 and 29. Luke 9, 28 and 29. This is when he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration. I want you to look at this, 28 and 29. Who's got that? 28 29. Go ahead, Dale. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mount to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. And of course, then we know that Moses and Elijah appeared, the transfiguration happened. But what I want you to see there, he goes, one, is that private place, he, one, he goes up on the mountain, two, I want you to notice who he takes with him, and three, I want you to notice that when he prayed, there was a reaction from God, and that the God, that he becomes enveloped, and as his glory shines through, and Moses and Elijah appeared, all right? Powerful, powerful way. In John 17, he prays uh, for, for the disciples. We'll come back to that one in just a moment. Matthew 26, verse 39, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed passionately. According to Luke 22, verse 44, he probably prayed so passionately, what happened? Sweat as drops of blood. I mean, we're talking very intently in his prayer. And what did he pray? Do you recall what he prayed? Take this cup from me, yet not as I will, but as thy will. All right. Jesus always prayed in passion because he knew who it was he was talking to, and he knew that the Father, that to pray to the Father is powerful and not something to take lightly or giddily. What Jesus prays for? Well, let's see some things he prayed for. Number one, he prayed for help. Now, wait a second. Why would Jesus pray for help? He's the Son of God. He still asks the Father for help. He still asks the Father for help, didn't he? In fact, I want us to look at Mark chapter 7, 31 to 37. Mark 7. 30, 31 to 37, Mark 7, 31 to 37. And I want you to look at the healing here, Mark 7, 31 to 37. Now remember who this is. This is Jesus. This is uh, the Son of God. I've got to get the right page here. 31 to 37, all right? He 
You got it? Ron, would you mind reading it for me, please? For Jesus loved the city of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and to the region of the Sacos. There were some people brought to him, a man who was deaf and could hardly walk, talk, and he begged Jesus to place a hand, his hand on him. After he took, took him aside, aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears, and he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, It's a mafia which means the open. At, at this, the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded him not to tell anyone, but the more he, he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He was, he has done everything well, he said. He even made, makes the deaf ear and the mute see. All right, so here's this guy that is deaf, and what does Jesus do to heal him? Huh? Took him aside. Took him aside. What else? I guess he spit on his finger. Spit on his finger. Put it on the man. In the man's ear. Okay. Well, is that what healed him? Is that what healed him? What healed him? Faith. The father. The father. He, he, oh, he, he looks up to heaven and what does he say? Be open. He is praying there, isn't he? He's praying to his father to be open. All right? He is, here's Jesus, the son of God. Here's Jesus, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Here's Jesus who has great ability, but he is depending upon his Father to give him the power to heal. And look at another passage. Uh, Mark 9, if you want to turn to that, verse 29. When Jesus came down to the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples were, there was a real conflict, all right? There was a guy, a boy, a man that had a boy, had a spirit, evil spirit in him, and it was throwing him all over the ground, and they asked the disciples to heal the boy, and what happened? Couldn't do it. So, of course, the guy in another passage just says, can you do it? And, of course, Jesus says, of course, he can do it. And so, what does Jesus, why did Jesus say they could not heal, in verse 29? What's he say? Only by prayer. This was not a simple one. It was only by prayer. It was only going to God that this boy was going to be healed. And Jesus would have prayed and the boy would have been healed. All right? And another occasion in the final week, turn to John 12. John 12. In John 12, Jesus again makes a prediction that he is going to be, going to die. We're going to look at verse 20 to verse 33. Now there were some Greeks among, among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda, Beth Bethesda, in Galilee, with a request, Sir, we would see Jesus. This is where our theme comes from, by the way. Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, Andrew and Philip, to, to in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servants also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Now what does Jesus do? 
He prays. I'm going to tell you something. I never saw this before. I, when I always think about get the times that God responds publicly, I think about the baptism, and I think of the man's transfiguration. For some reason, this always slips by me. Notice what happens. The voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd was there and heard it and said, it had heard thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time of judgment on this earth. Now the prince of this world will be drawn, driven out. And then he says, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. For some reason, I don't know why I missed that one, but I missed that one. But there was a voice the third time. God says, I did it, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to, what do you think he means by that statement? When God says that? What do you think he means by that? I'm going to, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. I have, I'm going to. Raising from the dead. Raising from the dead? What do you mean when he says, I have? He says, I have. When he brought Jesus to the earth. Okay, all right, so the first one is when he brings him to the earth. And the second one is going to be when he's going to be resurrected, isn't it? All right? Play, uh, plays a major part. All right, let's move on. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, verse 39, uh, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered his prayers and petitions and loud cries, tears of the one who could save him from death, but he was heard because of his reverent submission. At the cross, uh, Matthew 27, what did he pray? What's some things that Jesus prayed there? Matthew 27, 46 said, what do you remember what he said? My, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then another time he said, Luke 23, 46, into your what? Into your hands I commit my spirit. All right? Jesus also prayed for meals. We ought to mention that for the 5,000, the 4,000, for the Passover meal, he prayed every time. For the 5,000, the 4,000, the Passover meal. When he shared a meal with the Clepas and his wife, they prayed. Luke 24, that's when they realized that it was Jesus. All right? Besides praying for meals, when are you some times we could pray? When are some times we could pray other than when we pray for our meals? Can you tell me some other times we could pray? I was praying on the way to work. Pray on the way to work. Man, that's a good time to pray. Good time to pray. One time I... I shouldn't tell us. One time, many years ago. Many years ago. I was driving along and the state trooper pulled up behind me. <laughs> and he said, uh, what were you doing? I said, you really don't want to know. He said, yes. He said, I was praying. He said, get out of here. <laughs> hey, really, let me go, Nate. <laughs> Uh, and I really was praying as well. Uh, they already pray when you work, when you drive to work. What's some other times you can pray? Yes? I pray for about everything I ever tried to do. Pray for everything I try to do. Wisdom. Okay? And help, and help getting it done. Some of you, some of you have a prayer list. You pray for so many people every day. All right? Yes? I would say if it be thy will. If it be thy will, if it be your will, Lord, all right? Not my will, but your will, what else? As soon as I'm fully awake. Hmm? As soon as I'm fully awake. As soon as you're fully awake, all right? Great. What else can you pray? Right before I go to sleep, sometimes. What about when you, if you ever pray, you can fall asleep? Oh, yeah. Right, get up in the morning, finish it, finish it up, right? <laughs> Uh, God, what, that's a good way to go to sleep, right? Pray. Good, good way to go to sleep. Any other time you can pray? Hmm? Right before you travel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other times? 
And when I pray, your will be done, like he said, both of them said, I kind of have to begin to tone it down sometimes even, don't I? What I want to what your will will be done and seeking after his will. According to John 4, 34, who did Jesus want, want to please? Who did he want to please? His Father in heaven. That's all he wanted to please. I want to close this. Let's look at a quick parable in Luke 18. Luke 18, if you would. One to verse eight. Luke 18, one to verse eight. Then Jesus told this parable, told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with this plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she will eventually wear me out and, and with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep on putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? A number of years ago, there was, this is before some people's time, there was a show, Johnny Carson. Y'all remember Johnny Carson? And what would that man say? Get a shot. All right? That's for your time. <laughs> I'm too good. Uh, you were, but there was a guy who wanted to say that. And he wrote every day to Johnny Carson, pleading with him that he could say, here's John. Every day for four years. His wife said, you're a kook. You're really a kook. She divorced him. Finally, Johnny Carson responded and said, okay, I'm going to let you do it. And he got the opportunity because of his persistence. And Johnny Carson probably didn't want to get any more of those letters. He let him say, here's Johnny. Well, let me tell you, there is a power in persistence in prayer. I want you to look at this story. First of all, what, who are the different characters here? Who are the different characters? Woman and a judge. The woman is what? What do you know about? She's a, She's a widow. Well, what do you know about that widow back in that day and time? Hmm? Didn't have no husband. She is a woman. She's poor. She's a disadvantaged agency. All right? She is in a tough, tough situation. Probably uneducated, dependent on society. I mean, to take care of her. But she, what's the problem for her? What's her problem? What's that? Well, why is well, there a problem? What's, what's the problem? Huh? Adversary. She's got somebody that is causing her some trouble, all right? And she keeps on coming to this judge about getting it right. Now, the second is the judge. Now, judge was not like you think about judge today. Back in that day, they had a traveling judge. He would go to an area. He would set up a tent. Everybody could sit and listen to it. But not everybody, honestly, not everybody got their case heard. Usually the ones that got their case heard were the ones that you paid a little money underneath the table, all right? Those are the ones that would hear the case. Well, he's not hearing her case, all right? Not hearing her case. And so what does she do? She is persistent. She is persistent and comes every day. And the word there, it wears him out. What do you think that means? Tired of seeing you. I'm tired, I'm tired of seeing you, all right? She is wearing him out. It's a form of persistence, all right? And the, the judge is just, you know, he, he, what does the sales does it say about this judge? He has no fear of God. And what else? He's what? He's unjust. He's an unjust judge. And he don't care about people either, does he? It, so you, what do you think? He thinks of her. 
No. Do you think that he did this for her because he cared about her? No. Absolutely not. Now, what is the purpose of the story? Is it the, the, if you keep on pestering God and keep on after God, that God will finally give it to you? Like we human beings are like the widow, penniless, powerless, no statue, and we don't know how to have anybody. We're facing problems in our life, challenges, unresolved conflict. We can't handle them alone. We have nowhere to turn, and we must seek help from someone. Yes, if it fits, like the desperate widow, we need help. But God must be like the judge. I mean, I mean, he's busy doing other things. He got a universe to operate, angels to keep in harmony, those kind of things. There's so many needed people coming to him. I better not bother him unless it's important. If I'm desperate, then better do it what, what the widow did. I better pester him until he gets it. And God says, I can't take this anymore. Somebody fix the problem. Is that how it is? No. no. It's not a comparison here. God is not being compared to the unjust judge. It's a contrast, isn't it? The judge is unfair, uncaring, but God is loving. In fact, God wants to help you out, doesn't he? And God hears your cry. So he is in, in verse 6 and 8. He listens to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring a justice for his chosen ones who cry out for him day and night? Will he keep on putting them off? And the answer is no. Three important prayer principles I want to hit before I leave. And one, don't worry, pray. What do we usually do? We worry about it. We were. What does the Bible say in Philippians chapter 4 that I am? Don't. By prayer. Don't be anxious about anything. Pray. So the first thing is I need to do, don't worry, I need to pray about it. Number two, don't quit. Don't quit. Pray persistently. Keep on praying. Third of all, don't doubt. Pray positively. Let's look at two passages. The first one is in James 1, 5 through 7. James 1, 5 through 7. Don't doubt, pray positively. James 1, 5 through 7. Who's got it? Go ahead, Dale. Okay. James 1, 5 through 7. Yes, sir. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Don't doubt. you got to believe it. The last passage of 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that He hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. He hears us. He will hear us. I heard about a guy, uh, a church that was needing a Bible school teacher. And they presented the list to the preacher of the, the names of, the, of for teaching the class. And there was only one name on the list. And the preacher said, surely you can find somebody other than that person. He, he would just be the last on the list. The guy says he really wants to do it. So I said, okay. Let him teach the class. To his amazement, this guy did a fabulous job. Kids came week after week, were highly involved. And the preacher invited him out to lunch one day. He said, you know, he said, how'd you do this? Uh, I'd like to know your secret. And he pulled out a black book. And on every page was a picture of each one of the kids. And there were details about every one of the kids. Comes from a bad home life. It's having a hard time in school. Whatever it is, he said, and I pray for every one of them, every day. 
And I can't wait to get to church to see what God's doing in their lives. Well, I'm going to tell you, we need to believe people who believe in the power of prayer. When Jesus prayed, do you think that Jesus expected the heavens to open up? I think he did. And I think we, the Bible says, pray as if you've already, what? Received it. i got to pray with faith. Thank you. Let's close with a prayer. Lord, bless us this evening. And I thank you for everyone that's here. And Father, may we be greater in our faith. May we be people who pray more diligently in all circumstances of our life, bringing those requests to you. Thank you for all you do for us every day, Lord. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. Have a great week.